very much. Um, and thank you for the warm welcome to Ontario. Um, we come from Detroit, uh, which we win every trivia contest by saying it's the only place in the continental United States where Canada is to ourselves. So we're very proud of that little fun fact. Uh, it doesn't apply to Alaska, but um, we kind of know it works. Um, what we're going to share with you today is um, sort of one health system's perspective on this whole business of accountable care or um, integrated health care delivery, population health. There's a lot of different terms in here. Uh, many of the things that we're going to share with you were inspired by changes in the federal government in the United States or even at the state level. Um, but again, it's really just one, one perspective. We don't look like other health organizations necessarily in, in Michigan or even in the rest of the U.S. But hopefully there's some little tidbits here that are, are helpful to you. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Henry Ford Health System overall um, and then get into uh, a bit about population health and ACOs and how we define those. And then uh, some of our care model innovations and new capabilities that we put into place even in the last few years to address uh, changes. And then um, uh, we'll close up with a little bit of lessons learned so far. Uh, we're going to tag team Bruce and I. Um, a little bit, so I'll cover the first few slides. Um, first, I'll do the middle, the, the meat of the sandwich, and then I'll close out with that last piece of bread. Uh, Henry Ford Health System is located uh, in southeast Michigan, as well as in mid-Michigan, in uh, that, that little uh, yellow blob in the middle bottom of the mitten is uh, Jackson County, and that is the newest member of our health system, uh, Henry Ford Allegiance Health. Jackson County. And so um, there's some pictures of where um, our, what our hospitals look like, but a little bit more around the numbers. Um, so we serve about 1.9 million people in our health system in those those two geographic areas I just showed you. We have 30,000 employees. Um, we're very proud that at least 800 of them um, actually come from the Windsor Essex area and uh, work for us every day. They come across the bridge of the tunnel um, to help us deliver care to our patients. We have five acute care hospitals, um, and you can see some of the stats, 117,000 discharges last year, and three mental health facilities in Southeast Michigan. Uh, over four million outpatient clinic visits a year and delivered out of 200 sites of care. Uh, it says 158,000 urgent care and walk-in clinic visits. And there's another couple hundred thousand emergency department visits that we um, see uh, at our five different, uh, well actually we have about seven or eight emergency departments across the Southeast Michigan and Mid-Michigan area. Uh, we have, um, the Health Alliance Plan is our own provider sponsored health plan. So we own a health plan, but it's not the only way we're paid. In fact, it's a, it's a minority of how we're paid. We're paid through federal funding, through CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and we're also paid through commercial insurers uh, like Blue Cross Blue Shield. Blue Cross Blue Shield, of, Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan is the largest payer in the state of Michigan, but there are other commercial uh, payers as well. And 300,000 of the 550,000, um, well, that's not quite true. There's 550,000 lives covered by Health Alliance plans, so they actually insure 550,000 people. Um, again, we're just a piece of that. But all told, we have over 300,000 lives now in value-based contracts. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. But these are, um, this is where we actually are at risk for the dollars that we spend compared to what the expectations are or the benchmarks that are set by those payers. And then on the far right, we're going to talk a little bit more about virtual care later. but. We are in the virtual care business, um, over 3 million digital care uh, encounters, um, including uh, e-visits, um, clinic to clinic video visits, and we're now getting into um, cell phone, iPhone, Android visits where you can actually video visit with your physician. Um, so we're just starting in that world, um, but we're, we're on our way. We are an integrated health system. so. You see, there's, we broke this into two pieces, the parts that we own, which include the health insurance plan, um, the, the, we have employed primary and specialty physicians in the Henry Ford Medical Group. Uh, 
um, which is a large physician practice. We have our hospitals, the five hospitals, men mental health, and one of those mental health facilities is for substance abuse um, treatment overnight as well as day services. And then we, uh, we have employee community wellness programs, home health, we have our own home health care agency, but that's not all of, um, all of the home health services that we use, hospice care, pharmacies, and, and others. Um, but our partners are significant, so we partner with private physicians, including um, private physicians that are part of our clinically integrated network called the Henry Ford Physician Network, and Dr. Mima is uh, the CEO of that group, and he'll talk more about that, I think. Um, skilled nursing facilities are our partners, our long-term care. Uh, we don't own any of those, um, so we have to partner, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, the local health department, specifically Detroit, um, and uh, but also the Michigan Department of Community Health, and then other health systems who are our partners, um, but in some way our, our competitors as well. Uh, going into population health then, so um, when, when we first started down this road of population health, it became important to help describe uh, what that meant. <laughs> so we went out and looked for some some definitions out there, and so these four uh, we found helpful. The first is healthcare value, which is really uh, sometimes people uh, call it the triple aim or even the quadruple aim. I think that's a familiar concept, but it's really healthcare value is what is the quality and service that we're delivering and at what cost. So it's that ratio of improving quality, improving service. Um, divided by the cost it takes um, to deliver that care. Population health, um, I like to describe it as really a, it's a statistic. You take a given population of people and you say, what are their mortality rates or what's the incidence of diabetes or um, obesity or other chronic diseases? Um, we, we're often compared um, not very favorably in the U.S. with other first world countries in terms of um, the quality of our care compared to the cost it takes to deliver that care. And uh, so that would be a, a measure of population health as well. Population health management, there's lots of words there that I brought from a definition um, through the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. But um, in a nutshell, it's all the stuff we do to improve those statistics within a population. So it's the clinical programs, the, the collaborations, um, and partnerships that we have with all those partners to actually improve um, the rate of diabetes, improve mortality rates, uh, reduce costs, and add value. So um, that's what we think of when we think of a population health management, and that's what our department, um, Bruce and I run the population health department, that's the composite of the things that we're doing for the populations that we serve. And then value-based care, is how we're paid for that work. So we enter into um, contracts, either with the federal government or the state government or individual payers, or um, most recently with large employers. And we are paid differently based on what kind of quality and service we deliver and, and how we can reduce total cost of care. So those contracts have very specific measures in them around quality indicators, around service indicators, and around that cost. And then uh, if we spend more, we um, have to pay them back. And if we spend less, then we get to, to share in those savings. So that's value-based care. And then on the right is just a little diagram that describes that. Um, if, if you can see it maybe on your handout, you, you start with a targeted population, and, and it could be people with diabetes, it could be people who live in our zip codes, uh, it could be any, any population, it could be Southeast Michigan. And then you identify the care delivery models to address those things, and then you succeed or don't in value-based care contracts uh, or win new contracts based on the outcomes that we're able to demonstrate. Population health um, isn't any of these three things. Um, it's not a single department or function, so although I work in the population health department, um, this is, you know, takes a village kind of approach. Um, and so uh, often people think, well, what, what is pop health doing? I get asked that all the time. What are you doing in pop health? 
Um, and it's not just what I'm doing, or Bruce is doing, or our teams are doing, it's what all of us are doing. Population health is a concept. Um, it's not an individual health coach or care manager. So sometimes people say, well, we're doing population health because we have care managers out there, RNs or social workers who are um, delivering care and acting as coaches. That's not population health either. Um, and it's not just having a really good electronic medical record or other software or other tools. It's really a coordinated effort across all of those things. Um, care teams, partners, uh, assets of the health system, all working together in concert, that becomes population health. And then this slide um, is, is a little complicated, but it's trying to describe the evolution, really, of value-based care in the United States. So if you start on the far left, um, it wasn't that long ago that all of our work was paid based on how many of those things we did. So we do a surgery, we get paid uh, a negotiated rate with whatever payer for that surgery, um, end of story. And it wasn't that long ago, like within the last decade, that the federal government led the way through CMS with changes to that. So they introduced pay for performance or pay for value programs that looked like incentives for good quality or disincentives or penalties for poor quality. So higher readmissions led to penalties. Um, and this was after the Affordable Care Act was passed. So really this started about 2012, 2013, that we started to see penalties for readmissions or increased um, opportunities to earn back incentives for higher quality. Largely focused on inpatient to begin with in the acute care setting um, and later through physician programs that now reward physician groups for higher quality as well. That third uh, circle there, shared savings and bundled payment models, so those are fairly new as well. Um, this is um, usually upside only, we call it, which is where you have the opportunity to earn incentives for, for your quality or your cost outcomes. Um, driven again by the federal government, but, but now there are some state um, program state runs our Medicaid, our um, underserved, generally low income populations, um, our state run, um, and then the Medicare is federally run in the in uh, the United States. But we're paid differently in um, some cases uh, according to the episode of care. So you're paid for an entire episode or bundle. So you have a total joint replacement. We we get one fee will for everything, pre-surgery, surgery, the entire experience, whether or not you're hospitalized, and then all of your post-surgery care for a period of time. Um, so that's a bundle. Um, so those are out there as well. And then on the far right side, we've really gotten into advanced payment models um, in the U.S., and, and we've adopted those as well. So Dr. Mima will talk about the next generation ACO program by CMS for which we created a, the Henry Ford ECO to respond. Um, but these are um, opportunities for us to earn both upside and downside. Um, I guess you don't earn downside incentives, payback uh, based on downside risk. So we call those uh, upside downside or full risk contracts. And um, these are, uh, the opportunity there is tens of millions of dollars that we might have to pay back or potentially earn depending on how we perform. So many of the things that we're going to talk about um, in the coming minutes are really in response to those changes, those new contracts that cause us to behave and, and act and, and care for patients differently um, as much as possible. And I put that, that dotted line around those last two. It was really within the last couple of years um, seven or eight years that the creation of accountable care organizations became imperative to respond to these things. Um, and in some ways they were legislated um, that this is something that we need to do. And then on the bottom there, um, before I turn over the mic, uh, as, you, as we've moved through this continuum in the United States and at Henry Ford, um, the, the degree of clinical integration and partnership um, just keeps increasing. So not only have the risk rewards increased, but our need to work together differently um, is, is also increasing. So I think that's, that's important. Uh, thank you, Susan, and good morning, everybody. 
Uh, we really do appreciate the opportunity to be here and share in this dialogue with you. Uh, for me, it's a little bit of a homecoming. Um, my father's family actually originated in the London area, migrated down into Michigan through Sarnia, and uh, so I remember coming up to London in the summers for a big family reunion, so I, I feel kind of like I'm coming back home. Um, so in, during my career, I have been a student of healthcare quality improvement and systems analytics and systems thinking, and in that pursuit, uh, stumbled across a fascinating article uh, a study actually funded by the Commonwealth Fund in the United States. The name of the study is called Mirror, Mirror on the Wall. Some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, I think it's a, an amazing comparative analysis of the quality and value of healthcare across 11 developed nations in the world. And I'm sad to report that the United States is dead last in that study. It's an ongoing study. It's been going on for about 15 years now, um, and we're still dead last. Um, so, Susan and I come here with full humility. We, uh, we don't have answers. Uh, we're struggling with the same challenges that you are here in Ontario. So as you move forward in developing your Ontario health teams and your new approaches to delivering better value and eliminating waste, uh, we look forward to being there with you and inviting you back to Michigan to tell us what you've discovered and what you've figured out that we haven't figured out uh, sometime, maybe this year or next year. So thank you and we appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, so, what I'm going to do now is try to delve into what an ACO is, and I think you'll find there are some similarities between what we're doing here with ACOs or what we're doing in <coughs> the states and what you're doing with the Ontario health teams, and so hopefully there can be some synergy there as we talk about this. Um, so I'm going to kind of delve into some of the details. So, what is an accountable care organization? Well, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services has defined it as a group of physicians, hospitals, and other healthcare providers who come together voluntarily to give coordinated high quality care to Medicare patients. So Medicare patients, for those who don't know that, are seniors, over 65, disabled people, and also that includes people who might have Medicaid insurance who may be poor or indigent. Um, and so the other key point here is that while they do come together voluntarily, this is a very structured, regulated organization. CMS has defined very strict requirements for an ACO. And some of the key elements are, it has to be physician-led, so there has to be a physician governance structure managing it. Those physicians actually have to come together with what we call single signature authority. So the ACO speaks for all of the docs. The docs don't have a chance to opt out later. If you're in, you're in, you're, you're in for the turf the entire contract. And those physicians also have to agree to work together to measure its value, to have the ability to measure it, to define what measures they want to improve, and then to have a plan. They have to all agree on a plan on how to improve the value of care that they're going to be providing to their beneficiary. So it's very structured, but it is absolutely voluntary. Now the goal of the ACO is to coordinate care, to ensure that patients get the right care at the right time, avoiding waste unnecessary duplication, uh, errors, defects, delays, over-treatment, over-diagnosis. If the ACO succeeds, the ACO receives payment in terms of the, sa the dollar savings that were achieved. And so in a way, what this is, is a new payment model. It's actually gonna pay the ACO for care that it didn't deliver. And that care that wasn't delivered was waste. It wasn't adding any value. So if you eliminate the waste, you're actually going to get, you're going to receive some of the money you would have received otherwise. So, um, one of the questions that comes up is, why did Henry Ford decide to do this? We started in, in 2016, and we were one of the first 16 health systems in the United States to do this. There are now 51 other uh, health systems that are involved in this particular ACO model. Well, first of all, it was very consistent with our values. Um, we really fervently believe in putting the patient at the center of everything we do. We're a value, values-based organization, and that's probably our central, uh, central value. So this model really helped us focus in on putting the patient in the middle and doing what was best for the patient. Um, it also leveraged some of our internal capabilities. We have a history of taking risk, sharing financial risk, because we have our own health plan, health alliance plan. And so for the last 20 or 30 years, we've shared risk with the health plan. So we kind of understood that challenge. Um, 
We also have a very, um, I'll say, advanced electronic medical record system. Uh, we, we have EPIC, and we have fully deployed it into every nook and cranny in the health system, and we've maximized it. And I'm, I'm proud of that. I think you know every electronic medical record has problems and issues, so EPIC is not perfect, but we have maximized it as much as we could. So this gives us access to a lot of really cool information that kind of can track patients, identify patients who have challenges, connect doctors together. Um, uh, I think Susan and I think of population health as creating horizontal value in a vertical world. And so this electronic connectivity that we have helps us break down those barriers and those silos. The other thing we had going for us is that the Henry Ford Health System has done a pretty good job in the last few years financially so the system could afford to take some risk. Uh, and you'll see in a minute that risk is pretty substan substan substantial. Um, so the model itself has flexible financing. You have a choice uh, in terms of how much upside downside risk you want to take, but you do have to take at least 80% upside downside risk. And you can set some parameters on that. You can uh, gain or lose between 5 and 15%, so you have the ceiling and a floor. So you don't necessarily have to go bankrupt if you fail. Um, and so we have uh, 25,000 beneficiaries in our ACO, and the rough spend per year on those 25,000 beneficiaries is about $250 million. So if you apply the, the limits, uh, at, say at 10%, that's plus or minus $25 million. So at the end of the first year, if we had utterly failed, we would have literally had to write a check to the CMS for $25 million. So you can imagine, we had a burning platform. Susan and I had our pants on fire because we had to figure out how are we going to not have to write a check back to the government at the end of the year. The other cool thing is it gave us a chance to do what we love to do, which is create innovative care models and implement them uh, across the health system. So I'm going to get into a little bit more detail about um, structure of the ACO, but this is really sort of a flyover, and I don't want to spend too much time on this because I suspect you're going to have more specific questions that, that will make it make sense to you in terms of how do you understand an Ohio health team, an Ontario health team versus an ACO. In terms of the scope and the objective, um, the population, we have 25,000 um, fee-for-service Medicare patients. So these are patients who have full freedom to go anywhere. That's what the fee-for-service term means. They can go to any doctor, any hospital that has a Medicare contract. So we don't have a lot of control over them. We can't actually tell them to stay in network. We can't tell them not to go to Florida or wherever they want to go. Um, but they are attributed to us. So they are attributed to us because they have seen our doctors, the doctors that are in the ACO. So we, we are connected to them for at least some of their care. And it was enough of their care, so they're attributed to us. The model of the ACO model is really designed to get the doctors in the hospital and the facilities to come together for those 25,000 patients and really focus on improving quality, uh, experience, and cost. And so uh, the way that we have chosen to do that and the way that most other health systems have is to really try to develop new care models, care models that change the way care is delivered, solving problems and eliminating waste that these patients are experiencing in a very complex health system. We also took advantage of some of the unique benefits that CMS provided for this program. So CMS actually changed some of the rules <coughs> so it would make it easier for us to eliminate waste. Uh, one of the rules was, um, uh, and under, that's under new tools, was they eliminated a requirement that a patient had to be in the hospital for at least three days before they would approve transferring that patient to a skilled nursing facility. And you can imagine if you put somebody in the hospital just to get them into a SNF, that adds about $10,000 per patient. So we were able to bypass that. Uh, CMS also allowed for home visits, even for patients that weren't homebound after a hospitalization. CMS is willing to pay the beneficiaries $25 a year if they came in for their annual physical, their annual, we call it an annual wellness visit. And that was really important for us because we wanted to connect to the, with the patient, we wanted to make sure we had all their quality gaps and make sure that we had identified risk maybe that they hadn't identified themselves and we could start to implement the right kind of care. And then lastly, uh, CMS uh, gave us a waiver, and not just us, but all of the organizations in the ACO, to do telehealth, virtual visits, video visits, to connect with patients even though they weren't living in a rural area. 
CMS has always had an, an exclusion for people who live in a rural area, but this is for people that live in a metropolitan area. So we were able to leverage those new tools uh, to um, achieve pretty good performance. And if you look on the left-hand side of the slide, over the we're in, now into our fourth year. In the first two years, we beat the financial target by 2%. And in year three, we have the numbers, we just don't have the money yet from CMS, we don't have the settlement, but we're in the same range, about a 2% um, gain on the target. And if you do the math on that, it's about $5 million a year of additional revenue that came to, to Henry Ford through this program. And that more than pays for the investments that we made in the program. So we actually have a return on investment for that work and we have much better care for our patients. So it's really been, I'd say, a win-win-win situation for us. Of course, as you get better and the target is lowered, it gets harder and harder. So there's a ratcheting effect that's happening. And so Susan and I were hoping that our pants wouldn't still be on fire in year four, but they still are. So, yes. so now I'm going to dig into some of the uh, specific programs that we launched uh, at Henry Ford to create value. And uh, I'm going to sort of cover them. I'm going to cover the first six. And then I'm going to turn it back over to Susan, and she's going to cover the last two. So if I had one characteristic or capability that I could purchase or implement in my health system to create more value, it would be access. Access to the right care at the right time. Failing to do that results in unnecessary costs. It results in patients going to the emergency room. It results in patients getting admitted. Quality gaps get missed. Delays happen. People get sicker. In, I'm a primary care doc, and uh, we've translated that into a mantra, which is do today's work today. Figure out how to do today's work today. And so one of our central strategies in our ACO has been to provide multiple access options for patients and to give them a way to get the care that they need before it's too late. And so this is sort of a list of those uh, access um, programs that we've built. Um, first, within traditional office visits, we have built in same day and next day capacity. It's about 30% of our slots are held every day for patients who show up or who need care on the same day. They may not have known it the day before, and we can fit those patients in. We've added walk-in clinics and urgent care clinics, again, for the same purpose in all of our settings, almost all of our larger clinics. Uh, we have added a 24-7 nurse advice line. We did that about three years ago, where a nurse is there on the phone ready to answer questions. That nurse is also equipped with access to the appointment schedule. So if you call in at 2 in the morning because you have a sick child, that nurse can actually give you the appointment at 8 a.m. with the pediatrician the next day. Um, and then lastly, and, and I think most importantly, and, and our patients certainly love it, we've really maximized the, the patient portal through Epic. Uh, we've turned on every aspect of that, and, uh, and I think we've been a pretty effective at that. Um, I personally am sort of like a my chart Nazi. Uh, when my patients come in, I won't, if I, especially a new patient, I won't let them out of the room until they sign up for my chart so that they actually have access to the records. Because otherwise, if I get test results and I have to try to communicate with them the next week, I'm either playing phone tag with them and that takes a day or two, or I'm sending them a paper letter that's going to take like two weeks to get to them. So uh, my chart is a element for us in terms of access and so through my chart through the patient portal patients can get healthcare information uh, about their own health they can see uh, visit summaries they can actually now see my note so I do have to be careful what I put in that note because they can look at it if I say something about them that may be offensive to them that can be a problem so far we just turned that on in January so we've been at it about four months I haven't gotten any complaints and I have and none of my fellow physicians have been complaining that this is a problem so so far, so good on that account. Um, but they can actually um, send me messages, get advice from me, they can make appointments, they can renew prescriptions, they can look at their medic, their test results, they can see what they're due for in terms of health maintenance sorts of things. Uh, and they can do virtual visits now, and we'll talk about more about that in a minute. So this is sort of our wheel of fortune for digital or virtual care. Um, in the darker blue, those are synchronous visits that are happening in real time. So we have video visits. Uh, we've got scheduled video visits now, but in the fall we're going to launch uh, real-time urgent care video visits with your doctor. 
We also have clinic to clinic video visits, so a patient can drive to a nearby clinic and have a video visit with a physician who may be 20 or 30 miles away. So it saves a lot of driving for both the patient and the doctor. The light blue things are the asynchronous communication. So these are essentially messages that get left back and forth. And so we have my chart messaging, uh, we have e-visits, which are a more structured interchange between a doctor and a patient. We have uh, virtual post-op visits, which you can, as you can imagine, patients love that. You know, they don't have to get out of bed and get into a car after surgery. They can just uh, do an electronic exchange with their surgeon and send a picture of the wound and whatever else they may need to do. And we have a, a, a fair bit of remote monitoring, although I think this area is about to explode. Primarily, we use it for patients with chronic disease like heart failure to keep track of them and make sure that uh, they're not having an exacerbation that we won't find out about for three or four days and then they end up in the hospital. So um, diabetes is an epidemic in the States as, as it is around the world and I suspect it is here in Ontario. And so uh, it is really a hot spot for us in terms of creating uh, new value, reducing waste for patients. And so we, uh, we've actually been at this for a while. We've developed our uh, diabetes care centers. We have five of them now in Southeast Michigan. And they're really focused on addressing what I'll say is the fundamental problem of diabetes and frankly the fundamental problem for most chronic diseases which is helping patients figure out how to manage their disease and achieve control within the context of their daily lives. And for diabetes this is particularly difficult especially for people that are super busy who don't have a lot of social support. And so we created this uh, Diabetes Care Connection or Diabetes Care Center to help fill in those gaps, to help those patients achieve that control and as a primary care physician, I can assure you that I wasn't trained and I don't have the capability of figuring all this out in the context of a 15-minute office visit. So I can't do this as a physician. Only uh, this, these types of programs and these types of staff can do it. So this is really key. So we have um, a couple, we have five different elements to it. Diabetes self-education, nutritional therapy, empowerment groups, um, diabetes prevention programs, uh, because we are really focusing on trying to prevent the patient to progress to diabetes as a primary strategy to attack this disease. And then lastly, and the thing that I'm most excited about, which is in the, the orange, we have trained nurses who are certified diabetic educators to work with patients one-on-one -on -one in real time to help them solve the problem within the context of their lives. And these nurses are equipped with protocols that are reviewed and approved by the doctors they actually have the authority to adjust medications, to start medications within the protocol. They have a doctor who's one phone call away or one step away if they have problems. Uh, and I have seen miracles happen. Uh, I, said, I, am, I can send them a patient who has a lycohemoglobin of 12 or 13 that I've been trying to get controlled for the last year or two. And they will literally talk to that patient, email with that patient, video visit with that patient. And typically in the course of three to six months, they can get that patient under good control. So it's, it's a phenomenal program. Um, another key element to our overall value-based strategy is focusing on high-risk patients, patients who um, are likely to spend a lot of money and have a lot of need for healthcare in the, in the future 12 months. And that group is depicted at the top of that triangle, um, that red triangle uh, in this diagram on the left. And so we feel, and we've been at this for a while, but we feel that there's a big opportunity to improve our case management programs even further. And so we've developed a broader strategy, uh, which we're calling integrated case management, where we're actually bringing all of the case managers that we have, so the inpatient case managers, the outpatient case managers, the case managers that exist within the health plan, who previously didn't talk to each other a lot, um, didn't hand patients off very We've created, uh, under Susan's leadership, we've created a, a central hub model where all of these case managers are now gonna talk to each other and communicate with each other. They have a, they'll have singular leadership, singular central leadership. Uh, and so we're really excited about that. We're just now launching it, just now building it out. Uh, one of the key um, components for this was to uh, create a sort of a hub of resources because one of the problems we had in case management is our case managers were all out there trying to save the world individually. And so they would have to you know, make all the phone calls to the community uh, care programs that they're trying to connect their patients with. They have to fight through the red tape and they'd spend, even though they're master's prepared uh, providers, 
spend you know, 50, 60, 80% of their time doing red tape stuff. So we created a central resource hub so that they could uh, be more effective in their jobs. We also created standardization and process standardization in terms of documentation and handoffs between uh, the various case managers across the continuum. Um, and so uh, we, uh, we really think this is going to be an important strategy going forward to allow us to identify um, uh, the sickest patients and get them into a system of care, a case management system of care that will allow those patients to stay connected, sort of that horizontal, horizontal flow. And another thing that is a real challenge for us, um, and I'd be interested in hearing how you guys approach this, but is identifying those patients effectively and accurately identifying those patients who are going to spend or a lot of money in the next year, who are really going to need a lot of healthcare services. We have some syndicated software that uses claims data and some of them that use electronic medical rate record data to try to identify them based on certain characteristics. We are actually working on our own homegrown program to help identify not only patients that are high risk, but those that would actually be amenable to case management. But we feel like we have a long way to go in this arena and we'd certainly be interested in what you guys are using. Comprehensive Care Centers is another uh, pretty cool clinical model that we created. Actually, it wasn't our idea. We, we stole the idea from a couple of health systems. Essentially, these are ambulatory intensive care units. And they're focused on a targeted population of the sickest of the sick. Uh, these are the top 3% of patients, typically having three or four chronic conditions, typically not having really good social support programs, difficulties uh, with transportation and other sorts of things. Uh, we essentially used our uh, segmentation risk software tool to identify these patients and then we reach out to the primary care doctor and we ask the primary care doctor if they'd be willing to turn the patient over to the comprehensive care clinic, the AICU, to receive better care. Um, it's a team-based model, so in the clinic we have, uh, each of our clinics, we have three of them now, two doctors, we have a nurse, we have case managers, we have nutritionists, we have social workers, pharmacists, uh, we have a community health worker who can go out to the home. And this team actually does weekly case conferences. They have a, they work together and sort of multidisciplinarily understand the challenges of each of their patients and make sure they can deliver on that, uh, on that uh, care plan. Uh, we outreach to the patients. We keep track of them by phone, but then we bring them in, some of them every month, even more often if necessary, depending on how sick they are. We spend an hour with them. Each of the members of the team may talk to the patient while they're there. Uh, and we've so far had some pretty good success. If you look at our outcomes, uh, we reduced ER utilization by 22% and uh, hospitalizations by 21%. And total cost of care actually dropped by somewhere between 25 and 30%. So even though we have spent a lot of money on this intensive, you know, ambulatory intensive care unit, we have actually returned more money in terms of saved cost. And the patients love it. Um, we've had wonderf wonderful testimonials from patients who have said things like, you gave me my life back. I used to have to spend all my time in the emergency room. Now I have, um, I have my life back, so thank you. Another uh, uh, program that I think is pretty innovative, and we didn't think of this one, we stole this one too, um, <laughs> is a, a program designed to reduce um, ER, reduce admissions through the emergency room. One of the things we noticed was that there was really significant variation from one emergency room to another within our health system. And then if you looked within the emergency room to the doctors, there was significant variation from one doctor to the other in terms of how often they admitted a patient. And it wasn't explainable based on acuity because we acuity adjusted all of them. And we saw up to fourfold variation from one doctor to another and up to threefold variation from one ER to another. And so when we delved into that, we met with the chairman of the emergency uh, system and asked him and some of his colleagues what was going on. And they basically said, well, the, the real issue here is that some ER doctors have no faith in the ability of the ambulatory system to manage their patient. They believe that if they send their patient home, the patient's going to have a terrible outcome. Others have more confidence. And so that a lot of that variation is really just explained by faith. So we built this program to help restore the faith of these ER doctors in being able to deliver the care to patients after they leave the emergency room. So we basically have put an EDS, we call them an EDS navigator in the ER. They're EMTs or paramedics, and they're equipped with 
16 different protocols that allow a patient not to have to be admitted. So they can set up same-day dialysis. They have the pathway to get the patient in for dialysis, in for a specialty visit, in for a stress test, in for some kind of imaging, or if they just need to see their primary care doctor, they can set that up. And the coolest thing is if, if the ER doc says, well, you know, I really want someone to eyeball this patient tonight or tomorrow, we can also send out a paramedic the paramedic can actually go visit the patient in the home and check and see how they're doing. And if they're not doing well, the paramedic can actually just put them back in the, uh, in the ambulance and bring them right back to the emergency room. So this program has resulted in about a 4% reduction in admissions, um, and we've reduced medical claims expense by about $2 million. And so another, this is another program that has had a, re a return on investment. And by the way, the ER doctors absolutely love it. And we started off only providing it for our value-based care patients, the patients that we have risk for, but they are clamoring for us to expand this program for all of their patients. Um, so I'm gonna cover a couple more quick programs. Um, both of these, Oak Street Health and Pace Southeast Michigan are fairly new to us. Um, they are mini population health organizations. They're mini ACOs, mini comprehensive care centers, in a way, the things that, that Bruce just talked about. Oak Street Health is a new, entrant into the market just a couple years old they started in uh, indiana ohio illinois um, and now they're in michigan as well and they are um, groups that that focus on particular groups of patients they are uh, primary care physicians with all of that team-based care that we have in our comprehensive care centers they are targeting medicare patients and uh, they're they're uh, supported by some of the health plans that are supporting what's called Medicare Advantage, which are um, value-based programs for seniors um, that you can actually enroll in once you turn 65 in the United States. And um, so they, it's, it's both a, um, a partnership because they send us um, downstream patients, so people that need specialty care or hospitalization um, are sent to us from these, from these physician groups. They locate themselves in um, underserved areas, so they're actually seeking people that are uh, low income, who do not have a relationship with a primary care physician, and then they establish that relationship. Uh, the second one, PACE, stands for Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly, and I have to read that every time because I always forget what that stands for. But PACE programs are across the United States. We have one in Southeast Michigan. And again, it's little mini clinics, but it's very comprehensive in terms of what they do for those patients. They have to meet certain criteria. They have to be a certain age, a certain income level, and they have to be nursing home eligible, but able to live in their home. And then what these clinics do is they go pick these patients up, participants they call them, uh, Monday through Friday. They put them in uh, a van. They have a nice time sort of chatting with one another, so it addresses a little bit of that social isolation thing. And then they come into the clinic, the center, and they play cards, they get fed, they can do their laundry, um, they can see a, a provider, so that's their provider. Um, they can get um, new eyeglasses, hearing aids, everything. So it's a very comprehensive approach to caring for these individuals. We are, as Henry Ford Health System, majority owners in the Pace Southeast Michigan programs. There are five centers now, um, and we're on their board uh, representing the health system. Um, but this, this is really expanding because it's very, um, very powerful and the participants love it. Um, another program that, that or ser series of programs we've created, um, we created a preferred, preferred skilled nursing facility for long-term care uh, approaches. I mentioned at the beginning we don't own any of our own skilled nursing facilities, um, but we do partner with them. And we partnered also with two other health systems in Detroit who are trying to address the issue of too many people coming back to the hospital from long-term care. Um, so we were being uh, dinged in that readmission penalty I mentioned earlier, and uh, we needed a way to address that. So we brought them together and said, this is what we want to do. If you want to be part of our preferred network, you're going to have to meet certain quality criteria, things like lengths of stay within your facility, uh, readmission rates from your facility, and we want you to implement certain protocols um, and procedures for sepsis management or um, pharmaceutical um, availability over the weekend. We found that patients were coming back to the emergency department because they didn't have the meds in the, the skilled nursing facility that they needed to last the weekend. Um, we, t we actually send them home with 
a weekend's supply of, of medications, things like that. Um, and in return, we let them know how they're doing. So we share very transparently and openly how each facility is doing compared to its uh, competitors, really. Um, and we went from close to 100 skilled nursing facilities in our preferred network um, for geographic reasons down to 30 um, that we work with um, on a routine basis. We meet quarterly, we share data, um, we share experiences and protocols. And then uh, we also have case managers who work with patients who are in our skilled nursing facilities. They will interact with the care teams there, um, take a look at the care, the care plan, and also make sure that those patients have follow-up care with their primary care physician after they're discharged from the long-term care facility. And then we're doing something similar around transitioning to home. So by the end of the year, we want to have a preferred home health network um, as well. And then other caregiver support programs, we, we created um, the Caregiver Assistance Resources and Education, or CARE program. Um, a couple of years ago, this was initially uh, funded by grant money, um, and so it's got another couple of years, and we hope to make this a permanent part of our operations. We do things like um, courses for caregivers in the home, um, and even art therapy and other um, respite care or um, uh, activities to help those people that are now caring for their loved one all the time while trying to make, probably work full time, things like that. So resources um, online and in person. And then it says nurse recorded discharge instructions. This is a brand new pilot. We just did this, started this a couple months ago where we are using um, a phone app. We're working with a company that allows us to record the discharge instructions. So as the patient is leaving the hospital, we are record, having their nurse record the discharge instructions so that those can be replayed or forwarded to other caregivers um, anytime they want. And uh, this is really helpful because we all know that the last time you're paying, you're not paying attention, right? As you're walking out the door, you're trying to worry about your ride home and, and uh, you're not probably feeling perfectly and the family members trying to gather up your belongings. And, and so this is a nice way to say, go back and let's listen to that again, um, what that nurse was telling us so that we can remember. So we're very excited about that pilot. And then this one, um, I'm particularly happy uh, to, to report to you. Um, we have this program called Henry's Groceries for Health. This is actually a partnership with uh, Gleaners Community Food Bank in Detroit, one of the largest food banks in Michigan. There are two big ones. And what we decided to do was identify the patients in those comprehensive care centers and other high-risk clinics um, who are also food insecure. And rather than give them um, you know, sort of a prescription to go to the food bank or, or um, using funding sources from the state to pay for their food. We're delivering food to their home, uh, 10 meals worth every two weeks, which is intended to be supplemental, um, not everything they need. If they meet certain criteria, like they have the ability to prepare the food because it's not pre-prepared, it's not Meals on Wheels or something like that, it's, it's um, boxes of fresh, produce and pro fresh and frozen um, protein, and then staple items like uh, spices and things like that. And what we do, uh, we, we enroll them, we set it up as a research project, which is just now ending. So on a week from Monday, I'm gonna get the final results around the impacts that this has had on uh, the patient's um, biometrics, like their BMI, their, their A1C levels, uh, their hypertension control, and also their utilization of the ER or um, the hospital. And so we believe that we've had a tremendous impact on these patients through this program. And in fact, yesterday, I just heard um, the results of a qualitative study that was done with nine of those 300 patients we enrolled. Um, this appears to have changed their life. And it was I was actually getting misty listening to the results of this study because these people now know how to prepare food with less salt, less fat. Um, they are using spices. They are eating foods they weren't even aware of. Um, things like brown rice instead of white rice or cauliflower, it turns out, was not a common vegetable that people, people purchased. And so um, 
we, we'd love to tell you more about that once I get the final results, but we're hoping to turn this into something that we can fund operationally on an ongoing basis. Okay, so the last uh, category I'm going to cover is um, we call it ACO analytics. So oh, this is how we look at data and understand our data in order to deliver care differently. So we have consolidated all the data we have about our patients, either from uh, medical claims or from the electronic medical record and other sources, frankly, publicly available data around um, how many times somebody's moved. Um, so is there some sort of housing instability that we're dealing with here um, and things like that into a single enterprise data warehouse. And then we just continue to uh, use that data to run reports and understand more about our patients. Um, it helps us understand how each of these programs is working. So the data we showed you is, comes from those programs where we're able to say um, utilization changes or A1C improvements. Um, and we can take and, and report the data at a physician level, at a practice level, site level, regionally, by product, by contract. Um, and you can slice it and dice it. It's just a large database. So there's lots of different ways to report that data. Um, and then, as Bruce um, alluded to, we're, we're using it more and more for predictive capabilities. So we understand who are the patients that will benefit more from outreach um, than others. And all resources are limited, so if we have only so many people that can outreach to these patients, how do we pick and choose? So that's very helpful. Some of the measures of success, I talked about quality indicators and cost indicators that are part of the ACO model. Um, these are the ones that we've chosen to measure this year, just to give you a sense. But uh, readmissions, um, because we're penalized every year for readmissions, we have to focus on that differently. This year, we're focusing on patients with CHF and COPD. Um, and uh, because of our work with the skilled nursing facilities, we're looking at those readmissions as well. ER utilization is always a measure. Um, we want that to go down. Um, avoiding observation status or admissions from the from the ER to the hospital that are not appropriate for admission. Um, that's one of our measures. And then the quality measures really come from the HEDIS program, which is the, um, it's uh, run by the NCQA in the United States, but it's, it's a measure, it's a series of measures that are used by almost every health plan um, out there uh, to measure quality. So we, there's, there's preventive measures in there, there's uh, cancer screening measures, there's actual control of chronic condition measures, and then there's some utilization measures as well. Total cost of care, or PMPM, per member per month, is how we're measuring our progress um, in all things. Um, bonuses and shared savings, whether or not we got them, um, and how many of our patients are in value-based contracts. Um, so we call that value-based contract lives. And then the process measures are on the right. Other ways that we know uh, we don't have to wait for the outcomes that come months later. Um, we can actually look at how we're doing things like, did we get our patients into a, a primary care appointment within seven days of discharge if they were high risk within the hospital? Um, and uh, how are our programs performing in terms of outreach and enrollment and case management, things like that. So lots of process measures as well. So uh, we'll conclude, and then Bruce will join me up here for Q&A. Um, but a couple of the things that we just threw down, sort of, uh, we're learning what you're, you're about to embark on. Um, and so we're sharing a little bit about what we've learned over the last few years as we've gotten into this ACO world. Um, Bruce mentioned the upfront investment. Um, it, not insignificant, right? It, it takes money to save money, I guess. Um, and so. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have the ability to say this is what it would cost us and to get um, payment for that. And actually, in, in the U.S., for those ACO programs, you have the option of being paid up front. Um, you have to pay it back, but it's sort of an interest-free loan, and, and that really helps start up some of these programs. It might be an interesting thing to consider if that were possible, um, arranging something like that. Um, we, couldn't, we couldn't communicate enough. Um, about what this meant. Again, we were used to the pay for everything you do world. And as we move into the, um, it's not something to celebrate necessarily to have another admission. Um, it, we, it is, it's all about appropriateness. 
And so we're constantly talking about what this means. We give the same sort of set of slides internally within Henry Ford Health System all the time as we're trying to help people understand what we're doing. Um, collaboration with clinical leaders is essential. Um, we could not do this without partnering with our physicians um, and hospitals within the health system. Um, new teams and new community partnerships. So I, I, I heard a lot about that in terms of where you're going in Ontario. It's all about, it takes a village, right? Um, and so we are also doing the same thing, new, new partnerships like with the food bank I mentioned, but also with our long-term care facilities, with um, other programs, and even um, for-profit entities coming into our markets. We need to understand new ways to partner. Um, care management um, focused on the right places. So Bruce mentioned hot spots. Um, he uses that term. Um, but people with high needs, seniors, um, uh, people with chronic conditions, people who um, don't have the social supports that they need, be it transportation or food or, or housing, those are the big ones. Um, how do we, how do we uh, sort of embrace them in a different way, incorporating all those different angles? And then um, I mentioned the enterprise data warehouse and analytics. That, that's relatively new. Um, we stood that up over the course of a couple of years, and it's, it's, it looks significantly different now. What didn't even exist uh, back in the 20, 2012, 2011, um, and now it's, we have this capability, and we had to keep investing in it, um, and now people are thirsty for data. It's like we can't give them enough, um, and so it's, it's that whole, you know, so much data but not enough information, and how do we translate that into useful information? So those are our lessons. Um, that's where we are. I'll invite Bruce up to join me, and we have to entertain questions. I would say, and maybe I'm a little bit biased, but I think it's the physicians uh, coming together, and I think the structure of the ACO was up front defined to be needing to be physician-led. And so, uh, and that might even be the hardest part of all this, is to get all the doctors to agree on the vision, and then agree on the measures, and then agree on the tactics and strategies that we're going to use to, to, to succeed. Um, I, I think that, at least in the, in the states, the hospitals and the skilled nursing facilities and the other partners that you have to bring together tend to want to follow the doctors and not really be going in at, a, at cross uh, current to those doctors. So I think that is kind of why they've been the lead. But Susan, I don't know if you disagree. I don't disagree, but I would, I would say that um, at the very beginning we, we showed that we're an integrated delivery system and we have all those pieces and parts. So Henry Ford Health System is that anchor. Um, so the, the physician network is actually a part of the Henry Ford Health System or is incorporated under the Henry Ford Health System. Um, so it's all, it's, it's really the other, the community organizations are following our lead in a way, um, but it's, it's driven through the health system, not individual parts. But he's absolutely right that, it, that the, the physicians are the ones that are taking on the, um, the new care models that are so important. And so that's, that's helped. I would just add one thing. I agree with Susan that at Henry Ford, it really is the system. But in the other 51 organizations, and if you look at the other ACO models, there are a couple other models. There are about 400 other health systems that are put together ACOs, and, and many of those are just physician organizations. So, and the hospitals aren't connected to them in any way, and the SNFs aren't connected in any way, but still the doctors have still kind of taken control and made contracts and built relationships with these other systems to, to save money. In some ways, they actually, um, are competing for dollar flow because it, with the ACO payment model, the dollars are now kind of flowing into the ACO and then through out to the facilities. And so in some cases, the ACO has the ability to take volume away from a hospital and reduce revenue flow. And so that gives them even more leverage. So uh, it's a super complicated formula, so I don't want to get into too much detail, but what CMS said is you get to keep the savings that you generate, and that's where all the incentive is. There's no other payments that come in. It's just that incentive payment. 
it's modulated by quality and, and, and patient satisfaction, but you get those dollars. But you can only distribute those dollars to members of the ACO, full-fledged members of the ACO. So, for example, we don't have the skilled nursing facilities in the ACO structure. We don't own them, uh, we don't manage them, so they're sort of sitting on the outside. We, we have leverage over them, as Susan said, we, you know, we, if, if they want to get our volume, they're going to have to come, come together in our preferred network and do these certain things, but we don't actually have a way to align their payment model. So I think CMS was worried that these dollars would flow and then there could be, you know, who knows what kind of uh, unexpected consequences of dollars flowing to the wrong people. So they really sort of kept those dollars in the, in the ACO and that's the only place those dollars could be. I was going to say technology is probably the leading sort of non-financial incentive is getting connectivity with their patients, with their data. They not only, they have a lot of, uh, our primary care doctors especially have a lot of pressure to perform in all of the health plan relationships that they have. And so for them, aggregating data, analyzing data, reporting back to health plans is a big challenge for them. So we can bring to the table some abilities to do that for them and support them. I think the other thing is perhaps maybe it's more of a philosophical incentive, but uh, our doctors want what's best for their patients. And so if we can deliver uh, programs like the ones we talked about, the EDS program, the CCC program, the integrated care, care management programs, they see that as value. It's not direct money for them, but they have a sense of assurance that their patients are gonna be flowing through a system that works better. And, and they, uh, they basically are very much aligned with that. That. How do we manage our data security through the network? Summarize your question. Um, people much smarter than us <laughs> develop HL7 and different standards. Um, HIPAA is a big deal um, in terms of privacy and security. We have a whole department that does nothing but ensure the, the privacy and security of our data. Um, breaches do happen. People lose their laptop or something, you know, they're not supposed to do these things. Um, we, it, we're required to demonstrate the reason why we're accessing the record every single time we're accessing the record. Um, and that's tracked and monitored. It's a terminable offense if, if uh, you're accessing the record for reasons that are not for patient care or research, um, and you have to indicate that. But in terms of the, the, um, the tubes and the tunnels and the connectivity, Again, smarter people than us are figuring that out <laughs> within the information technology department. Are there different layers of access depending on yes. the person accessing whether it's purely demographic data or purely non-identifiable yeah. um, aggregate data? Yeah, data, data access is restricted by your role within the organization. Um, and so I, I can access aggregate data um, actually, I can access chart data because I went through training and attested that I would use it only for the purposes I'm supposed to use it. Um, but, um, and then physicians all have sign-ons. You know, their medical assistant or their nurse has a different sign-on to the same data. So we can always track who's accessed what. And I would, I would add that patients can actually look into their own record and see who has accessed their chart. And then they can, they can raise a concern if they see something that they don't understand. Okay, so patient engagement. So we do have patient family advisory councils throughout the health system. Um, we have one for population health, for example, um, to help us look at the priorities, the things that we're thinking about, new innovations, and, and how we might address it. We also have patient advisors on our um, some of our boards and committees, particularly the quality committee. Um, and um, I don't think we have a patient advisor on our, our health system board yet, um, but I believe that's in the works. But we do have people that are, they are the strategic planning committee um, for population health, for oncology services. Um, there's a number of other ones out there. The caregiver program I talked about, um, we have a patient advisor and council for that. Well, I think one of the lessons we learned in this is we tried to over-communicate, and we, we did. We over, I mean, I think in the first 
three months after we signed the ECL contract, I gave like 40 presentations across the entire health system. So I think that helped reduce some of that, so the message was clear. Um, you know, the health system constantly struggles with um, citizenship issues and um, core value issues. And when I say struggle, I mean we really seek hard to um, make sure that we're all aligned. And so our leadership team at the health system spends a lot of time talking to all of our employees about the vision and the mission and our core values and our strategic direction. And I think, um, fortunately, we have a new leadership team that has really even taken that to the next level. So I think that, to some extent, that was done for us by a, uh, an enlightened health system that said, you know, we're taking on this new challenge with the ACO. We need to really think about our overall culture and how we work together. And so really break down those barriers and really help other people understand that we're all in this together. This isn't, you know, the hospital's trying to survive even though the, you know, the pharmacy unit is not surviving. It's really a, a, a team effort. So I think all the effort the health system put in, all the effort we put in up front to do the communication made that less of a problem than you might think. I think the challenge we still face though probably boils down to the lack of financial incentive alignment. And uh, in particular between the hospitals who have open beds that they want to fill, and the ACO that wants to make there make there be more open beds that aren't full, and uh, and take beds offline. And actually, I was very heartened to hear what Anthony had to say about what you've done in Ontario in terms of reducing your total beds. That is incredible. Uh, we are nowhere near. We just keep adding beds. You know, if you looked at our curve, it would just be a slight upward drift, and that is killing us financially. And it's one of the reasons we have such a ridiculously expensive healthcare system in the states. I think we're twice as expensive as Canada, and we, have, we rank at the bottom of that uh, mirror, mirror ranking. So I don't know if that helped. I don't know, Susan, do you have any other I, I just wanted to add, uh, you made me think of it. All of this requires us to think as a new leadership group, right? With, with a shared vision, shared values, shared mission. And um, we, we reconstituted just last May our whole strategic plan as an organization. And um, being, uh, being considered a high-value network was one of those strategic vision elements, which really puts it right out in front that that, that is as important as performing well in any of our markets, um, financially or you know, with bed size or anything like that, and as important as customer engagement and as important as delivering the highest quality care. And that really helped it change the mindset in terms of um, we're all working together for the same things, and we reorganized our entire leadership system just January uh, as a health system. It required a new way of thinking and a new way of operating to respond to those new imperatives. And I would suggest that you might be in the same situation here. <laughs> this is, you have to think very differently. I don't know that we see that as a big deal in the, in the United States. I think we, we have built programs for our less fortunate patients, our indigent patients, to connect them into social services. But for the most part, because our healthcare system is, is really much more of a private system, um, the patients kind of have to figure it out, I'll say a little bit on their own, within the confines of their health insurance policy. So the primary care docs sometimes help connect patients and our care management programs help connect patients to social service programs that might help them, but I, for the most part, they're kind of on their own to figure it out. And actually, it's a great question because that may be one of the reasons why our healthcare system is so inefficient and so expensive. Uh, so thank you for that. I'm, I'm gonna offer one and then I'll let Bruce think about one and then maybe we'll come up with another one. Um, it, to this last point we just had, I think coming together and figuring out that shared vision um, and the strategy for working collectively is going to be incredibly important. And um, sort of mapping out the difference between where you are today and where you want to be. Um, and, and not getting caught up in the individual details of that, but, but starting with that shared vision of where you want to be and how you can respond to those three imperatives um, that Anthony outlined, I, I would say would be a big takeaway because you don't just sort of say, well, tomorrow we're going to create an ACO. Let's go. You know, right? You have to sort of think about what the future looks like. So that would be one message. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think um, I completely agree with that, and I think that is probably the most important uh, thing that I would say. Um, I think related to that is being really brave and <coughs> courageous about ex uh, exposing your defects, seeing where your problems are, and being super honest about what your problems are. Because the more honest and, and, and real you are with defining your problems, the more likely you are to get everybody to get on board. And so you really actually need to listen to the people that are doing the work to help identify the, the defect in the problem. And I love the concept of hallway medicine, stop practicing hallway medicine, because it's so clear what you're trying to, the problem you're trying to solve. And I, I, that's a beautiful thing, but do that. Make it, make it honest and real so that everybody gets on board with Yes, that's the problem we got to solve because that's where it starts. If you everybody's bringing their own parochial, politically motivated solution that they've been trying to implement for the last five or ten years, this isn't going to work. It's just going to turn into a political, you know, war. Start with the patient and their experience and the people that are delivering the care and identify where the real defects are. All right. So I have one more. It's a not what not to do. Um, I've been actually, honestly, thinking about this the last couple of weeks in a number of different conversations I've had, but um, we have to think about, um, to borrow a hockey term, where the puck is going and explore what um, our patients and communities need that we don't even know they need and neither do they. Um, so I think the last thing we want to do is create better film and film cameras, right? When it's a digital age and iPhones have changed our life. So what does the future look like in terms of healthcare delivery? I think we all need to do that constantly. What does the future look like? And um, let's not try to make incremental change. We need to make broad, huge change.